Hello all, and thank you for joining this week's Friday Night Live here at the Walk Weekly Podcast. Let me say on behalf of the team here that we are thrilled, I mean thrilled, to have this special guest in the house. But I will say that he is the head of New York's Strongest. Now you got New York's Finest, for New York's Bravest. He's the commissioner of New York's Strongest. And he has a department of approximately 12,000 employees. I am your host, Walter Latham, and I'm joined by your host, Michelle Sweeney McCombs. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our co-host and my partner, Michelle Sweeney McCombs. Michelle? Hey, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Walter, and good evening to you all on the Walt Weekly Friday Night Live edition. Uh, thank you to our audience for joining us. Please follow the Walt Weekly and share this podcast by clicking the share button below. Walt Weekly is brought to you by Michelle Sweeney's Hair and Skin Care. Our intro and outro music is provided by Uncle Nephew. Joining us also panel member Christopher Sweeney, CEO of Johnny Roos Smokehouse and retired New York sanitation worker. Thank you, uh, Chris, for joining us. Today's guest, we have a special guest. Uh, the department, New York City Department of Sanitation is the world's largest department of sanitation. Uh, DSNY collects more than over 10,000 tons of residential and institutional garbage and 1,700 tons of recyclable each day. That's a lot. While efficiently managing solid waste and clearing litter or snow from 6,300 miles of streets, the department is also a leader in environmentalism, committing to sending Zero waste to landfills. That's huge. So um, our special guest we have was appointed by Mayor Bill de Blasio, Edward Grayson, as the commissioner of the Department of Sanitation on December 31st, 2020. Grayson, a 21-year DSNY veteran, has served as acting commissioner excuse me, since September 2020. Prior to his appointment, Grayson most recently served as a four-star chef, chief and director of the Bureau of Cleaning and Collection in, in September of 2017. Commissioner Grayson has held a range of positions throughout the department. He was operations chief overseeing snow removal during the 2016 Jonas Blizzard, the largest snowstorm in New York City history. As director of the Bureau of Cleaning and Collection, Grayson oversaw day-to-day -day operations, including the collection, recycling, and disposal of more than 12,000 tons of waste per day and efforts to keep the city's communities healthy, safe, and clean. He has implemented new technologies to improve snow removal and reform frontline operations, and he has been a leader in the department's implementation of the city's aggressive zero-waste goals. His father was a long life sanitation worker and supervisor, and his mother was recycling outreach coordinator during the rollout of the city's groundbreaking citywide recycling program in the 1990s. Commissioner Grayson was raised in Ridgewood, Queens. Please welcome DSNY Commissioner Edward Grayson. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute yeah, pleasure to be here. We appreciate that. Thank right you. on time with those applause, Walt. You're doing good tonight. <laughs> That's fantastic. You see, you see what I have to put up with? You see? <laughs> <laughs> what I have to put up with? Oh, my goodness. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. They keep me going, Commissioner. That they is fantastic. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to all the DSNY family out there. We appreciate oh, everybody we joining. We appreciate the kudos. Um, you know, it's really uh, the men and women of the department, uh, you know, Chris and alumni. Chris and I have history. We worked together uh, for many years in Queens, and I just know him. And, and just that that the men and women who work for the Department of Sanitation, both uniform and civilian, they are just true heroes. They're everyday heroes of New York City. Um, they are unsung. Uh, it's a funny thing about sanitation. Um, you know, we are judged by our failure because success is implied. Most people don't look at it that way. You know, every single day people put a can out 
every single day you walk past, you just expect that to happen. And you never think about, you know, the thousands of people who are out there literally daily. Like you said, those are staggering numbers, 10,000 tons of refuse, almost 2,000 tons of recyclables a day. And you think about 12,000 tons of material getting moved every single day by men and women on trucks. And then behind them is a team of support personnel and supervisors and mechanics and lawyers and, and computer technicians and clerical workers. And, and there's this entire incredible group of human beings who all come together every day to deliver something that really does greatly impact the quality of life for all New Yorkers. And it is always, I'll take, I'll take uh, soundtrack applause and more importantly, not for me, for them. Uh, they are everything. They are the face of the job. They are the people who do everything. And I love them. Amazing. Thank you. So. Well, he's on time again. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. We love it. We love hey, it. Commissioner, uh, yeah, I got to edit night. So tomorrow, you know, I'll be doing a lot of editing, right? They're giving me more work. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's all love. Right. It's love. So let's get started. Chris, we're going to start. Uh, hand it over to you right now. All right. Thank you. Uh, Eddie, appreciate you coming on. Uh, Thanks for taking the time out of your busy schedule. I know you are busy. It's a lot going on coming out of the winter. So we appreciate you. I just want to start off having you tell us a little bit about how you rose through the ranks to become the commissioner. How oh, to get your start. We all know it's a city test, a city exam. Let's put that out there first and foremost. To come on the job, you have to take a city exam. And uh, but give us some uh, insight on how you rose to the, through the ranks. Yeah, no problem. I mean, I, it, for me, the story, you know, Michelle did a good job explaining. So, so both my parents worked for the department, but Chris, you nailed it. Not That did really nothing for me to get on the job because um, they all took civil service tests too. So in my neighborhood in, in Ridgewood, you know, when you hit, when you were coming up, so the, the people that lived in the neighborhood, uh, all the fathers and the, all the people who had, you know, civil service jobs, they would tell you, you got to get the chief, you know, the newspaper to tell you where all the all the city tests were. So you would get the chief every week and you'd wait in, in the back of the chief. Still to this day is the notice of exams for all the city jobs, all the government jobs, all the federal jobs. It's all there. And, you know, they would say, don't be a moron. Put your, you know, sign up to take the test. And, and when me and my friends, when we all turn 17, 18, 19, just keep going, you just keep signing up for tests and taking them. And, and before I started with sanitation, I actually worked for transit. Uh, I was a bus driver. Uh, Brooklyn Division, uh, love that. But I had taken a bunch of civil service exams. And then when I finally got called for sanitation, I went, I, I transferred over there. And at that time, my father had already been retired. My father started in 1970, and he was already off the job for almost a decade by the time I came on. And my mother was a civilian employee who was on the recycling rollout team. But again, you know, she, she got her start because when they started recycling in the mid-80s, they went to, my mother was a community board, active in the community board, active on the school board. And they literally went on this aggressive hiring practice, trying to get people incumbent to every neighborhood to become outreach workers and go teach people how to recycle. Because in the, in the, the mid to late eighties, it was really a brand new concept. Like in, my mother was literally out there teaching people, you know, rinse out a tuna can and all this other stuff. So, uh, a decade after that, I get hired and I, I go through the ranks. I, I worked in Jackson Heights, worked in, uh, Queen three. I went there. I did litter baskets. So I was a sanitation worker for about four years. I, you know, uh, 9-11 happened. I was one of the thousands of people who, from the department who spent some time on a 9-11 cleanup. But then right after that, there was that uh, budget crisis. And then they delayed, you know, uh, some of the promotions, some of the promotion exams. So four years, uh, I was a sanitation worker. And then I got promoted to supervisor. And then I worked in uh, community board five in Queens again, and just knocking around street supervisor, working with the men, trying to, you know, learn and be this younger guy. Sometimes you're, when you get hired, I, I was about 27 years old when I got promoted to supervisor and you have these people, they got more time than you. They're more seasoned than, you know, there's the, 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 the rank and then there's the job. And, you know, my whole entire journey along was number one, trying to be, remember where you come from. You know, I had that familiar love for the job always, whether or not, my family was still working actively or not. And uh, then just trying to understand how, how we move the pile, continue to just learn every day. For me, you know, the department does this amazing thing. Um, they put out department messages every single day. And literally on these department messages you know, that come across on like a teletype, almost look like a telegram coming out on, the, on a printer inside the district. 
uh, they tell you all the rules and regs and all the things you need to know to be really good at sanitation. And I just would read them. And people say, how do you, how do you know all that? And I would say, I just read. I, the, the, t- the thing comes out and it says everybody should read or they should announce it at roll call. And I would read. And that's literally how I got my knowledge base. And I just came in and worked real hard. And I was always a yes. I was one of those guys. I was always a yes for all the time. I was a, always a yes if you needed something. And I'm a pretty simple fellow. You know, if you ask me to do that, I say, okay. And I learned a very valuable lesson um, in coming through anything. You can have the answer when you're done. You know when sometimes somebody says, why are we doing this right now? In, 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 a, in, a, in a rank and file agency, I don't care where you are, if the supervisor is like, we're going to go do that, I need this done, the best time for you to learn why is after you're done. Because after you're done, we got the job done, and now they'll tell you anything. And so that's what I would do. I would just say, sure. And I would go do whatever they asked me to do. So I keep, I kept taking some tests. Uh, and then I uh, worked in, I got promoted to superintendent and I worked in Queens East. That's where I met Chris face to face. He was the bar operations clerk. Uh, and again, there's one of those interesting dynamic relationships where you're always constantly learning. It had nothing to do with who had rank. It had who had knowledge. So Chris was like, key personnel, you're going to go in there and you're not going in there and say, this is what I need. You're going in there like, how are we going to get this done? Because what his facet was, was so, so epic on borough wide operations. You needed to know that you needed to understand what his resource and value was. And then, uh, in, when we were in Queens together, uh, from there, uh, Queens is a huge zone. So Eastern Queens, uh, lots of mileage, big snow operation, a lot of collection trucks running every day in, in that entire portion of Queens just because of the land map. And then, uh, I made deputy chief and, and, and so on and so forth. So then from that point on, just for the, for, for the sake of not boring everybody to tears with my <laughs> ascension, uh, in essence, I held just about every command post you can have, um, and, the reason, I've, if, if, if to cut someone of the lead out, um, my main thing is uh, I've been blessed with being an employee centric and a learning centric management style. Uh, I believe everybody has value. I believe everybody brings something to the table. And I believe that you learn just as much from your failure, if not more, than you do by your success, particularly on operations. Um, you plan and then you have to be willing to you know, look at the plan and it's nice to have a plan, but then when the conditions, you know, it's not just garbage. You know, it's one of the things that, that people think of all the time, whether it's us on snow removal, debris removal, um, you know, refuse recycling, daily collection, it's not the same every day. The conditions are constantly changing and you have to be able to adapt even for the sanitation worker on the truck who may have a steady route for 20 years. He or she is thinking all day long. Where am I? Where am I going to put the truck? Where am I? Going? Where's my partner? Are we being safe? How am I going to get that awkward shaped thing through two park cars to get it to the truck? And this becomes this spatial um, walking geometry that you're doing all day long, and you never give yourself any credit for the active and passive thinking, thought process, analytical response that's going on just to do something that most people don't recognize. It's happening all day long. It's a really good sound base to to become a decent manager in anything you're doing. Uh, If you think about what you do all day and write it out and say, wow, I do a lot of thinking. I do a lot of planning. I do a lot of forecasting. I'm watching a lot of trends, oddly enough, and this is how anybody would gain success. So for me, it was always keeping my ears open. Um, definitely, as you can tell, I'm not shy. It's not, I didn't always have my mouth shut, but trying to have an opinion when one was needed and certainly shut my mouth when I needed to learn something. And, and that's really how I got to rise through the ranks. And then, uh, in all honesty, um, becoming, going from the back of the truck to the corner office, becoming commissioner was never a plan. You know, there are some urban legends out there. Oh, Grayson said he was going to be commissioner one day. Uh, I probably <laughs> might have said that in 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 jest. I think everybody um, said it too. You know, like I, we, you know, it's everybody has it right, right, Chris. I mean, it's something you say in jest, yeah. and I can tell you that even to this day, uh, I, it's an absolute honor to be the forty fourth commissioner. And of the forty four commissioners, I am the seventh of forty four who actually started out as a sanitation worker. So I'm very proud of that. Uh, the department is one hundred and forty one years old. And the, oh, the thing that I would recommend that everybody always remember is uh, I joined the department. It didn't join me. And it's been a it's been a great ride. And I've l- literally loved every minute. Excellent. Excellent. I, I, I know that your mom was uh, integral in the rollout of the recycling uh, program. That is one of the main reasons that I got hired back in 99. I actually took the test in 90 
And I was one of the last people off that list to get hired. And it was specifically because of this recycling rollout. So just want to throw that in there. You know. um, I want to ask you, I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, we, Since we're talking about the department in this way, we all know how important the police department, the fire department are to the city, the roles in this city and, and the dangers of their job and, and, you know, the respect that they earn. And it's well-deserved, right? We all know that. But it is not common knowledge, the dangers that sanitation workers face on a daily basis out there in the street picking up garbage. And there are many who get hurt on a daily basis. There are people that are getting hurt. And many who have lost their lives. Can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. And, and, and I totally respect the opening context. Yes, everybody knows what the traditional defined first responder and the roles that they play and, and the dangers that they inherently face. But sanitation work by, by no means necessary should ever be undervalued for the danger. Um, believe it or not, sanitation as a profession um, and, you know, waste removal services as a profession is one of the most dangerous jobs in the country. Every year you can look it up on Forbes. It usually makes the top 10 list. And we're talking about behind some of the real biggies that people would know in throughout industry standards. You know, sanitation comes in like after lumberjack, you know, uh, crab fisherman and the guy who juggles chainsaws in the circus. Like it's really dangerous. And people don't people don't, you know, recognize that you're walking in and out of traffic the conditions are constantly changing. The, the terrain you have to, to, to be in, the amount of heavy machinery that's involved, that coupled with just the fact that inherently through how people set out their material for collection, there is complete uh, sharps hazards, lacerations, cuts, bruises, scrapes, strains. Um, having at some point in time a lifting injury or an ergonomic repeat uh, muscle memory injury is is really really common in in this profession and and it takes a lot and we and despite and you got to remember that people most departments and most or uh, even private organizations they're going to have some level of a training program that that's going to show you proper ways for lifting techniques and lifting from the power zone and taking time but the truth of the matter is is that as you have more and more tenure in what you're doing you start to and I'm not going to say cut corners but you start to become your own version of ergonomically sound and you learn your own biomechanics and every now and again just because of the changing conditions whether it could be slippery footing because there's nothing worse than you know we're the heroes of every snowstorm that's 100 percent. but then if you're the man or woman on the back of the truck having to tread through that now icy snow mound and still do all the lifting it completely changes your center of gravity it completely changes your your sense of stability and and it is definitely a dangerous job. And, and the men and women that do it every day, it's really a grind. Uh, they are definitely absolute heroes. And and yes, you can. Sadly, we have had instances of you know people throwing out the wrong thing. You know, one of the one of the most tragic ones ever was somebody threw out some uh, acid, and our sanitation worker didn't know it was improperly disposed of, and and they breathed in all that fume, and it basically you know it it, it killed it killed that sanitation worker. And uh, we've had people who were, you know, hit on the back when back when we used to have steps, they got hit on the, the side of the truck. And we've had people just, you know, you never realize you're not in control of, of the strains and, and, and when your body's going to give out. And I have to tell you that there's nothing worse. Um, and then just recently, sadly for us over the last two years, just like many other essential and critical workers and workforces, you know, we had 10 members of service pass away uh, from uh, covid and where this year is 20 years out from 9-11, and uh, we're up to over 100, about 103 members of service who we didn't, the Department of Sanitation didn't lose anybody at, you know, at ground zero with the impacts. That's, that wasn't our role, uh, but we worked the pile for months and months after, and we're up to over 100 members of service who have lost their lives since in 9-11 related illnesses. So there's definitely this inherent danger, uh, and, and, more, and, and absolutely every single day, we have members of service get hurt in the performance of their duties for the city of New York. Yes. I, I want to just stress that, you know, in regards to public safety and public health, the department is right up there with those other agencies. So in, in importance, you know, just people take it for granted a little bit as to what 
you know, what we do and what we deal with out there. And um, we want to say rest in peace to all those that lost their lives in the line of duty. Uh, Walt, you have anything you want to ask before I go forward, Michelle? No, go ahead, Chris. All right, we're going to keep going. All right, so, Ed, you were appointed by uh, uh, Mayor de Blasio before he left office. Um, We have a new mayor, Eric Adams, who's come in. And for this mayor, he has made a conscious effort to have women and minorities at the forefront of his administration. How is uh, the DSMY following suit? My understanding, the last four star, the last, the first and last four star female chief was uh, Chief Pardini. Are we uh, having any uh, inroads in that in that area? Well, Chris, that's a great question. You know, and what it comes down to is is we 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 definitely have we have uh, you know we have. Thankfully for us, um, we have with attrition. So it isn't that you, you got to remember there's a command structure and then an org. So for us, it's about having eligible candidates to be able to look and broaden our horizons on. Now, as far as female employees, it's a very small number of female employees, uh, particularly on the uniform side and particularly as they promote up, um, a lot for whatever the myriad of reasons are. Um, and what we always want to do is have a, a relationship where we expect, and, and this is a great forum for me to remind, and possibly anybody on the job who's listening, we, the department, wants everyone to come down and seek promotion. You know, the, the first three, the first two promotions in the chain of command on the uniform side are testable. And we want everyone to watch out for the notices, study, take your test, and, and, and get appointed to that position. And then... For the one and two and three star chief, you know, th- those are for the one and two star chiefs. There's a promotion board and it is literally a you submit a resume to get an interview. And believe it or not, we don't get a lot of I mean, the last time we ran a one star uh, board, um, you know, when you think about possibly having a, a candidate f- field of over 100 people that should have come down, you know, we only got 17 resumes. So we're not really, if we openly solicit for resumes for people to come down for promotion, you know, and that's a myriad of reasons because you know what, as you, a command officer in the districts, um, it's a very, very tough uh, job, and but there's also a lot of opportunity to work extended tours. You know, I think that the last two years are not really representative of the amount of yes, extended tours. Real. Really, I think that, you know, mm-hmm. the last two years, the number of extended tours at the supervisor and superintendent ranks um, so in, in the, the DSNY chain of command, it's sanitation worker, supervisor, superintendent, deputy chief, which is one star, assistant chief, two star, chief, three star, and then director, which is four star. And I think that the last two years would be not the quite representation because we had a hiring freeze. We weren't, uh, we, did, we had limited attrition, a hiring freeze in the ranks. And, but we have, though, thankfully, we have been promoting, and I can tell you that over, at least in the last two years since I've been commissioner, I am glad to say that I feel that the promotions have been very, very solid. We have great candidates. Um, we have gotten another female two-star chief, which is good because now she becomes a candidate when we go for three-star chiefs, right? So now we're at least expanding in that pool, and I think that, that what's nice to do is that, that people would understand that the key thing about being eligible for promotion is to say, I want to be promoted, putting yourself out there, because we don't just forcibly promote people. There is an, a, an interactive process. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask you a question since you touched on uh, the lives that were lost during COVID, you know, and we both lost people that we personally knew. Um, it was a difficult time for many. I had just retired right before the onset of COVID. So I wasn't there to see a lot of what you guys were going through. And with the department such as ours, you know, with many people from different political and religious backgrounds and they have different core values, how difficult was that to manage COVID with the vaccine resistance or hesitancy and all of the guys coming down with uh, sickness, young ladies and men coming down with sicknesses. And um, I'm sure it was difficult. How did you guys handle that? Well, 
That's a great question. And it's so, it's such an interesting thing. When I think, I think that one day when, when we all reflect back on this past two year period and hopefully, you know, the recovery and, and, and hopefully this, this virus itself is hitting, you know, what we've all read about possibly getting near a stage where it's an endemic as opposed to a pandemic. And I think that, that in the beginning, you know, when the fear was at its highest, you know, I think that the main thing that the department we were focused on was just trying to create the sense of of safety and not we were trying to create actual safety but you know everything was doing i remember when we didn't know 100 percent how long the virus was going to last on surfaces now in the department of sanitation we're a surface we touch things all day long we pick up pails we you know and and every bag of garbage whether people want to real think about it that way is an unattended piece of luggage at the airport we don't know what's in there we go up and down the block and we get what's the set outs are and we take the refuse and we take the recycling and then for a while there there was that that uh, we couldn't get exact clarity on whether or not it lasted longer on metal or on paper and then you know how far and and and, and as you well know chris just from being on the job but for everybody the cab is only you know six feet wide you know it's so you're in you're in a closed area with your partner and and we were trying to continue to keep each other safe and it was we took some steps we uh we tried to limit you know sanitation workers will often work with and on the job it's called out of town you know you may be assigned to you know queen's district 12 but you may have to report to queen's district 7 for the day well we stopped all that so now we kind of in in-house you know uh we kept everybody in their own location because we wanted to make sure that we weren't by our operations itself spreading people who could have been in contact with one or amongst the other ranks. Plus, we were trying to stay day on day service. I mean, Chris, you brought up something before about how important New Yorkers, are, you know, DSNY is to the, to the everyday health and wellness of New York City. That's why our logo has a caduceus on it. It is totally health related. Uh, it is totally, you know, we were telling the employees, you know, we were having these, these, you know, real impassioned roll calls and, and messaging service. We were reminding everybody on the job that, if you come to work, you might get sick. But if we don't come to work, everybody gets sick. It is it is clear cut. You have to have sanitation. You have to have the refuse and recyclables removed. If it's not removed, you're talking about all kinds of other problems, all kinds of other real public health problems. So us keeping our core services going throughout the entire pandemic, as the sicknesses were waving and cresting, you know, in that first round, we got we were getting hit hot and heavy, and then it, it, it subsided for the summer, if everybody remembers. So we were heavy into March. Thankfully, we had missed the winter. And then by the summertime, things had, we had learned a lot more. We knew that it really wasn't so much living on touch surfaces as, and we started cleaning the facilities more and more proactively. You know, everybody was really, really doing, you know, just as a culture, we were all washing our hands and using sanitizer. And, you know, everybody still had that high heightened sense of awareness to wear your hands, what your basic hygiene practices, which are always good business anyway. But, you know, and and then we got another wave leading into the next, you know, fall and winter. And then we had a really tough winter as a department with snow removal. I mean, that that went not this current winter season that we just got out of, but the winter season of 20 into 21, you know, we had almost 40 inches of snow. It was a very heavy year. Uh, we had another wave and staffing outages, and we were trying to keep everybody coming in. And I have to tell you, Chris, and you'd appreciate this uh, just by being, you know, uh, on the job. I have never been prouder of what we've been able to do to keep core services going um, and, and maintain. And, and the men and women that came in, and they, they came in every day, and they did everything that they could. And we had outage rates up to 25%. 25% of the department out sick, which is insane, insane, staggering numbers of unavailability. Our entire service provision is based upon how many people we can put on the front line. And when you're already down to a three quarter pool, and then you have to split the shifts in half, and then you have to balance where all the assets are to make sure that you're giving plowing services or collection services as equitably as you can, because we don't want anybody filling up on garbage, recycling and, and having safe streets. And it really was something that is, I think that when we look back on it in history, you know, as a department, I'm not, I don't know if the world's ever going to give us a, a real pat on the back, but when we look back, when we like every good thing in history, when you, you take a, a good minute to breathe and you look back on it, I think you're going to be, I think anybody who looks at it's going to be very, very proud of the amount of hard work 
that was done by the men and women of the department, how the employees adjusted, how the managers tried to keep in line with what was going on, the realities of the stressors, of the needs of our service versus trying to maintain the humanity of having people on the job. And then I have to tell you that, that uh, it is definitely challenging on the emotional side. You brought the point about the different belief systems and how people felt about vaccine and, and uh, natural immunity. We had over, right, even to this day, you think about a department of almost 10,000 people, we've had you know over 5,000. So half of the department has literally contracted the virus. Ten people lost their lives to it. Uh, myself, my family got it. You know, it went through. So when you think about having the understanding, having trying to have the compassion, right? So this is the big difference. The compassion and empathy for how people believe, what you believe, what you want to do to run your family, run your life, um, how you think the, the virus interacts. Uh, like for me, I remember I already knew I had the antibodies. I already knew that I was, I had been able to thankfully in get through my family's bout of the virus. Uh, we all had fevers and my daughter had that. My daughter who's 10 had that rash that was going all over the kids' bodies. And, and, and we just thought it was fever blisters. It was before they got that. They, they gave it its own COVID related, uh, by proxy symptom for kids. But, but I, my mother lives in assisted living. So I'll, I'll put that out there. So for me, the minute the vaccine became available. Now, mind you, I could have got the vaccine earlier, not because I'm the commissioner. I could have got the vaccine because I'm a cancer survivor, 9-11 responder. I could have been in the first wave of the people that they gave the vaccine to. I chose to wait until they let the entire job. Remember, they didn't let sanitation workers get the vaccine. We were in like the, there was one, one A, we were like two B or whatever the hell it was. And once they let the department get it, I was one of the first people to get it. But that's because I knew where my mother lived. My mother lived in, in assisted living. I got like, I have to be able to go check on her. Right. So I knew that they, that was going to be in lockdown. So I didn't really do. I understand how people felt. Even to this day, I completely understood. And, and I totally have empathy and respect for people who are saying my body, my choice. I don't want to put this in me. Um, but I knew that I had this image that I wanted to be able to champion vaccines for all the employees. We fought. I was begging them to let us get the vaccine. So I was going to be the first guy to have his arm up. And there was the picture going all over the smart boards and all of our districts with me with my shirt rolled up getting a vaccine. But on a personal level, I don't mind sharing tonight on the, on the podcast. My mother lives in a nursing home. I need to get a vaccine because I'm going to go check on it. That was it. It was a, it was a no brainer for me. So I didn't have. Absolutely. I had to cut. It was cut and dry for me. And, th and that didn't mean that I didn't respect everybody else's personal choice. But then when you get back to now brass tacks, how do you manage that? In the end of the day, I'm going to follow the policy. So there was a citywide mandate policy put out. And what we tried to do was give all the employees as much information as they could have so they can make their informed choice. But we're a rank and file, follow the order agency. And we did that. And I do, I, and I would say this with absolute, I, I would hope, and it's so hard. We know we have members of service who had to leave the service or they retired Absolutely. Early, and they, they made choices that were about a vaccine by the way, when they were with us on the front line, when there was no vaccine. And I have to tell you that if I had to pick one thing that is heartbreaking about that, um, it is that I was with them on the front line and then they yeah. had to leave the service for their beliefs. I, I wanted to touch base on that because, you know, sanitation is not a set aside from anybody else. You know, this is a this is a, a countrywide issue, you know, nationwide. Right. And you had people who, uh, you know, had strong feelings about it on both sides of the aisle. And, you know, I do want to commend them because they did come to work, even though they felt the way they felt. And it was a difficult time. I, I know it had to be hard to try to uh, accommodate. You can't, you can't. One thing I know about the sanitation department, you cannot accommodate everybody. It's going to be some people that are just not going to be happy with some of the decisions that are made. But you got to protect the whole, right? So I kind of understood where where the, the line had to be drawn because it couldn't continue to go the way it was going. It couldn't stretch out. I'm familiar with it more more than most people. I have a connection to a lot of people on the job, and I speak with them every day. But I want to pivot to the lifting of the mandate now because that puts – the, the department and not just the san sanitation department, just city workers squarely in line with this mayor because 
people had to walk away from their jobs. You know, can you speak to that a little bit? If you can, I know it's a tough, touchy thing. If you can, if you can, I understand. Oh well, well, no, Chris, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you that. What I will say is that I can. Uh, what I will say is that I have complete, as Commissioner of Sanitation, I have complete empathy for people who could look at at a changing, what could look like as a changing of position, um, and then feel further uh, alienated. Right. Alienated, I, yes. I, I really do understand that that's the belief that how anyone could feel like that. So for that, again, I can extend my empathy um, as far as a policy decision. That policy decision is based on health people like that. That's that's something that I, I am. I when it comes to the mandate and enforcing of what the city's rules and regs are as a public official, as an appointed public official, I will follow what the rules above me say. So to that end, I totally get it um, just because I'm a human being who watches the news and understands. And I have personal friends, also mm-hmm. close personal friends on this job and in other jobs who the mandate for public workers impacted their families. And it is definitely weird to take what anybody could look like as a, 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 a neutral position. I don't have a neutral position. I have a position that in leader, I'm a leader of a city agency we have to, and like you said, it's interesting. You can't accommodate everybody, but in order to move forward, in order to make sure that we have our critical services, we're going to make sure that we have enough people coming in every day. And I'm glad for the men and women who went and, and complied with the mandate and they're coming in. And for everybody that we didn't, we'll, we'll wait and see if there is a change in, if there's a change in policy, personal, this is personal. If there's, a, if there's an official change in the official policy, Naturally, I would love to see people who want to go to work go to work, but come back me, to work. Yeah. Right? If if that if there's a change, believe me, I, on a personal level, that would be I would be I would love to see that. But for now, I definitely can understand if somebody feels alienated, um, and 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 they definitely have my empathy. All right, I, I wanna I wanna add this in real quick because. Um, the segment of workers that I'm getting ready to speak about were very important to me in my role in the department. And I'm speaking of the civilians. I worked closely with many of the civilians on the job who have a ton of knowledge. They've been there a long time. Many of them, they work side by side with you. And, you know, it's my hope that the department recognizes that sector, because to me, you know, you remember what I said at my retirement party, you know, the foundation of the building is at the bottom, you know, and many of them are considered, you know, I'm, for lack of uh, coming up with a better term at the bottom, right? The bottom rung of the department with the sanitation workers and you go up as the levels go up, but they are the backbone, the strength of the department. And they're there. They don't, they don't necessarily make the same money that the uh, uniform workers make, but their their importance to the job cannot be questioned. And I would hope that moving forward, the department would reach within that rank of a worker and pull some of them in and put them in positions like the, the, the PAAs. And, you know, instead of going outside and hiring civilians to do certain jobs, you got a rank and file there who have, clear knowledge of the job and that's a place where they they should be tapped into and they should be considered when moving forward and molding a job many of them are women let's put that out there clearly right so if there's a place for women in the department we could kind of reach into that bag and kind of pull some of them up because Without them, I couldn't have done my job. They were very, very important to me. And I know many of them work very close with you. You know, how do you uh, feel about that? I, I, Chris, I think you bring up a great point. I think that one of the things that, that we can do better as a department on, and it's actually our goal to do, to continue to do inreach and, and make sure that, that the, the civilian employees on the job are aware of the opportunities available. Sometimes, you know, especially it's an interesting thing, you know, um, just just next just next um, in about two weeks where we're having a retirement party, uh, you know, a send off for someone 40 years of service. Um, 
just an incredible person who, who again, started out as a, as a basic shop clerk and, and made the department a very career part, raised a family, you know, and, and she's been such a pivotal person uh, to so many, helped so many people really with, with make sure that they had benefits, make sure that, and when you think about that and you say to yourself, well, that's one inroads, but how do we make sure that everybody on the job is aware of how do you find opportunity? How do you have, and that's why I really do feel good that we're in a place where we're moving ahead with trying to offer additional training, additional computer training, additional, uh, you know, emotional intelligence training, the kind of things that when you go out there and you can look for job opportunities. I like the fact that the department has definitely done all it can to make sure that we're reaching the people on the PAA list, uh, make sure that we, when, when they introduced another title available to civilian employees, which was administrative manager, that we've been doing some nice work with that. And there've been some real champions uh, that have come up through the ranks there and, and really can promote. And what I want to definitely stress while we're talking about it tonight is that, that the department needs to make sure that everybody's aware of the potential jobs that are available and trainings that are available to extend, but more importantly, to stress for any of, of the people listening who happen to be in department employees on the civilian side, know that you're valued, know that you can be more. You know, a lot of times people ask, well, what do I have to do? And the truth of the matter is, is that on those department messages or on the internet or by call, watching the DCAS job listings, there are definite ways that you can continue to network. You can continue to go seek a supervisor and say, hey, I'd really like to take this class. Is there anything you can do for me? And we definitely have been become a place where that is totally acceptable to do. So I would like to recommend that. But Chris, I, your, your point is definitely well received. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think that, you know, yeah, I mean, at the end of the we, day, the we job have value. Done by there's everybody. value there. No, yeah, the there's job value done by there. All of us. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, so I want to make sure that they are recognized and there's a light sh uh, shine on them because honestly, they, they come to work. Many of them, they, you know, single mothers, they do the hard work, man. They, they're out there grinding with us and they should share in the rewards of um, what's out there. Speaking of um, hirings, <laughs> I'm trying to pivot into certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I know, we're in a budget crisis right now a little bit and it's understandable considering you know the amount of money in overtime and and things that, of that nature that you guys just a hiring is there is there any news about new hiring that people could uh, look forward to you do know that the department of sanitation test is probably the most coveted test not coveted job in the city a lot of people don't realize that, but it's one of the biggest tests. Is there any news on that front? Absolutely. So first and foremost, um, that's a great question. And, you know, the last sanitation test was given in 2015, and there was supposed to be a test that got postponed because of the pandemic. Uh, I am happy to report that we are still planning. And it's if you go to the DCAS website, first things first, definitely go to exams for jobs and nyc.gov, DCAS, and look for uh, employment opportunities. And this is for everybody. L make sure that you're, you're, you're paying attention to that because in addition to not only sanitation worker, it's every open competitive, every promotional test that's available in the city. There's a calendar. You can get the notice of exam, see exactly how to go about setting up a test. So we're working with DCAS right now to make sure that we're, they're creating a brand new sanitation workers exam to th that's going to come out. And I'm very confident that we're going to see some notifications on that and be able to have a test for a new exam to come out very shortly. For anybody who took the last exam, uh, which is test number 5001, um, believe it or not, we are, you're going to see some of the people, if you have a, an active list number, this is another one where I want to, I want to make sure everybody knows you can go to nyc.gov slash DSNY and on our website, on the department's website, it'll show you employment opportunities. And it's going to give you an entire breakdown of where we currently stand with that old sanitation worker list. We do intend to have a classes from that old list. All right. So we're still going to, people are going to be getting notifications soon that your number may be coming up. Um, and I have to tell you that you should, if you, if you're, if you're someone who took that old exam, please make sure you know what your list number is. Please make sure if you, if, since it was such a long time ago, you may have changed email addresses. You may have changed physical address. You may have changed your number. You may want to make sure that you reach back out to DCAS 
and update any of the information that we have to get in contact with you so that we can, if we put out a hiring you know, uh, notice for the old list, if you took the test in 2015, we want to make sure that you're available because we definitely expect to hire this year because we do, even though our headcount hasn't gone up in this year's budget, our budgeted headcount, we, w- we have people retire every year. So we have, you know, we intend, intend to hire a few hundred people probably, you know, starting in the next fiscal year. So just definitely make sure that your information is up to date. So we do expect to hire. We do expect to replenish the ranks that we are budgeted for. Uh, and that's going to be this summer off of the old list. So definitely go to nyc.gov slash sanitation and employment opportunities. The other thing, Chris, that I think uh, would also be good to talk about. Well, let me let me stop you real quick because there was a question out there. Sure. How does hiring how does hiring work versus budget cuts? And I think you explained it a little bit because we're going to have people leaving through attrition. So even though they're in a budget crisis, you still have to have a certain level, a, a, a number of people working. Am I correct? No, you're 100 percent correct. So our budgeted headcount using just the, and we're still in the preliminary budget phase right now. So the preliminary budget reduced our heads uh, by, you know, a few. But in the end of the day, uh, we still have to replenish our ranks. So because there's normal cyclical attrition, people are eligible to retire and they retire. Um, we will have to do some hiring. So while our overall total number budgeted will go down, we'll still have to hire a bunch of people to get to that new number. Excellent. Excellent. You could continue uh, your other point if you remember it. Uh, yeah. Well, well, if you go to that, if you go to our website and, 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 you know, and look for employment opportunities, there's also another thing that I think is, is pretty good. And we've been doing this great job. We, the Department of Sanitation has been doing a great job trying to increase our contractor capacity, particularly with minority women, women owned businesses, the MWBE program. And we have this great program. It's called SOAR. So it's, um, sustainable operations, readiness, and resource. So SOAR, but you'll see us and, and we really have a team of people trying to do all we can to give, to give small businesses and individual people who are looking to start a business all the information that they would need to be able to do business with New York City itself and more importantly with the department. Now it's interesting when you think of DSNY, a lot of our contracts are, are long term, big, big contracts, the contract expenditures are for things like heavy fleet and waste disposal contracts. But just like every other agency, we do all the work that is clearly in line with bringing on more and more vendors, more and more contractors. And I would like to just definitely make sure that everybody knows that if you go to the website, so it's nyc.gov slash DSNY, and in there, there are some really great tabs. One of them is employment opportunities. And inside employment opportunities, you will find the latest and greatest on uh, job opportunities for actual you become an employee. But more importantly, there's a lot of information you can pivot to that will tell you how to become a contractor or a vendor with either the department itself or the city as a whole. Yes, I don't I don't think uh, enough people understand, you know. When you hit, when you think of sanitation, you think of garbage collection, but it's just so much more to it. You know, we we're involved with uh, stadium cleanups, uh, dealing, working with uh, uh, City Field, uh, Yankee Stadium. There's so many other facets of the job that people don't know that we do, and it's important that we kind of get that information now to let people know the hard work that you guys are doing, and we appreciate it, and um. It's been a great interview, you know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you coming on. Me personally, my time with you was great. Um, getting to know you, I mean, we, we hung out off the job. I know you personally, so and I know you in a different way than other people do. But I also know that you got a job to do, and it's not an easy job. You 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 had a department with with a lot of people, a lot of moving. Uh, moving object, moving objects, a lot of things going on. And it's, and it's, and it's a tremendous, tremendous task. And I think you've done it well. Everybody makes mistakes. Nobody is perfect. You, you know, you were learning as you, you went, you, you came in probably in the worst time of any other commissioner with COVID and all those things. So we want to commend you and congratulate you on the job that you did and just congratulate the whole department because you guys really stood up and stood out in a time that was uh, crucial and you were needed. 
Chris, I, I thank you. I thank you for the words. It's been a pleasure to join you guys tonight. Um, Walt, Michelle, Chris, it's just been a, a, a great panel, and I appreciate you all. Um, and I definitely appreciate that the, every opportunity that I ever get to tell the world, to tell your listening base um, how great the men and women of this department are. Uh, really, it has been an absolute blessing, you know, 141 years almost of the department being in existence, formed in 1881. Um, they didn't need me. Uh, I joined this family, and uh, it has been an absolute pleasure. Um, it is a blessing to be able to be of service. And I think that that one of the things that the the the, the takeaways, the beautiful gift that it takes a long time to realize when you're a public sector employee is is it's not about coming in every day. You're making your money for your family. You're doing a thing to get through the day. And one day you get to look back and you get to realize that there are 8.8 million New Yorkers and every single day you coming in and doing your job, just what you have to do is to the betterment of the entire group. It's to the betterment of New York City. It is to the betterment of a rotating cast of people and tourism and people just trying to have a good day. And while I am pretty positive that um, most people don't give it its credit because while if you walk out of your house in the morning on your way to work or you're taking your kids to school and your garbage cans are empty, that may not likely be the start of the best day of your life. That's not your first thought. You just put the cans away and you move on with your day. But I can tell you that I think we could all relate to the fact that if you come home at the end of the day and the garbage isn't picked up, that could certainly be the cherry on top of the worst day you've ever had, right? And it's the weird context in which we live. Sanitation work and having good quality of life and clean streets and the belief that there, that you have a, a plan in place to not live in a place that's dirty and filthy is so important and it's so critical to public health. And knowing that if you're going to plan your day because who can take the day off, you know, in a snowstorm and, and know that you can get there safely and know that there's a, a team of people who are working constantly around the clock in the worst conditions ever to be your first responders every time it snows or every time that there's a hurricane. And when you look at some of the most in, incredible things, it's that, that cathartic moment when I, I reflect back on it, you know, that time, all that time during Hurricane Sandy, it's 10 years, you know, this October since Hurricane Sandy. And, and there we were, we were the only responders you know, to help people get egress and, and going through that cathartic moment where, you know, you, you watch people and they were, ho they were so protective of their belongings and they didn't want us to take anything in the beginning, only to come back just a couple of days later at the insurance adjusters or after they had gotten their pictures taken. And then we were crying with them as we were loading the trucks and they were begging us to throw their life away. And because they had to make that, that painful emotional journey to realize that those are just things. And, and they had to make that hard choice to get rid of the things that were holding them back for rebuilding. And when you think about sanitation workers and the sanitation experience and how every single day, the men and women of the department, really, we live in your past. Um, every decision you've made is literally in the can out in front of your house and we're there to help you get rid of what you're done with. And while it may not seem as cathartic to you, uh, we're helping you heal every single day by taking your past away. And it's one of those weird things that you get to look back and wax poetic about on a Friday night podcast with some really good people. Um, but it's been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. Absolutely. And I, I can't thank you enough for the venue. Uh, mm -hmm. I have nothing but love for you all. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you for being a follower and yeah. listening to us. I just want to say also yeah. real quick, you have been the best commissioner ever because I live on Staten Island and I don't know how many times when Chris was working and other sanitation workers that I knew, I would make a call because my snow, my block wasn't shoveled. There's no salt, et cetera. But since you've been on, I have not one complaint. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. Can't, doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> yeah, you got a, a happy cut. That's somebody. right. That's, and that's great. That's, that's right. Great. Commissioner... Yeah. You know, I want to thank you on behalf of the Walt Weekly Podcast team, you know, for being such a fantastic, fantastic guest. And uh, I also want to let you know that we will be doing a rebroadcast of this show on Sunday after 3 p.m. And it will be pushed out to all the podcast platforms. So 
wherever you get your podcast, you can find the Walk Weekly Podcast. And so this episode will be out on Sunday after 3 p.m. Mm-hmm. And again, thank you. We're honored. And Chris, you covered everything. I have not tried. I tried. <laughs> you did great. I tried. I really fantastic. tried. And I, I appreciate him again. And um, we'll do it again. <laughs> Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you all. All right. all right. Let me turn it over to Michelle so we can, she can take us out. Thank you very much. Okay. Right. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. And thank you to our featured guest, DSNY Commissioner Grayson, for joining the Walt Weekly Friday Night with, Friday Night Live with host Walter Latham Sr. and co-host Michelle Sweeney McCombs, panel member Christopher Sweeney. And of course, our live audience. Thank you for all joining us. You can follow us at thewaltweekly.com. Instagram and Facebook at The Walt Weekly, Twitter, Walt Weekly, Podbean, The Walt Weekly, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and all your streaming platforms. Thank you all. Be safe as COVID mandates will be lifted. Still be safe out there. Have an awesome weekend. Good night, everybody.